First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, last week we uh, spoke about this verse and the following. I just want to highlight a few of the things that we spoke about. One is the word arm that was to prepare, to, um, to weaponize yourself, so to speak. Arm yourselves with the same purpose. It needs to be our determination, our purpose. What is that? He will tell us later on. But because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And we also said that just because you suffer, it doesn't mean you're going to be sinless. I, I wanted to clarify that. This is very important. One commentator said that uh, if suffering made you sinless, Pharaoh of Egypt, who suffered a lot, wouldn't rebel against God. He would follow him. He would turn around and repent. As you know, the more he suffered, more he progressively got worse and worse and rebelled, rebelled against God. So suffering does not equate purity. So as to, now this is the purpose that he alluded to in verse 1. So as to live the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. What was, this is the purpose we are to arm ourselves with. This is our purpose. Our purpose is this. To not to live our time for the lusts of flesh and the way of the Gentiles, we are called in verse 3. To live the time we have on earth, not for what we want, but for what God wants. Now let's pause there and look at our lives. How much of what we are doing during the course of a day is because of God's will in our life? This is not to say we are not going to have desires or plans, goals. But it does mean that our goals need to be given to us by God. We usually find ourselves as believers in a place where we make up our own mind and start praying about it afterwards. And this happens so fast and we are so good at lying to ourselves and saying, no, no, I didn't decide yet. Usually, we decide we want something pretty quickly. And we can collect arguments to support that, how that's God's will for us. But usually, we need to slow down enough before we make up our own mind to seek the Lord in major decisions in our lives. Now, I'm not talking about what shirt you're going to put on? You don't have to ask God for that. Because if there is any legalistic tendencies in you, you could take this will of God thing to heights that wasn't designed for. But it's very important to know that God has a plan and a purpose for every single one of us. It wasn't just to be saved and go to heaven. It was to be saved, to serve his purpose for our life on earth, and then go to heaven. So there is a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. And as believers, when we say we want God's will, that's what we're looking for. Lord, what's your purpose for me? Usually that's where we drop the ball. We say, okay, we, well, the average life should be this way. 
I should have uh, this much income, I should be married, have kids, I should have that, I should have a house, I should... Those are all good intentions. This is not to say you're not going to have them. But where is God in all this? For instance, when you decide which school you're going to go to, what you're going to major in, do you ask God? Or do you decide? Or when you're seeking employment, are you asking God to open the door that he wants you to be in? Or are you thinking, this looks good to me. I'm going to do that. How about marriage? A lot of single people deal with this issue. Am I going to be married? Or who am I going to be married with? Should I do something about that? Those of you that know me know that I am a firm believer in letting God engineer our circumstances. Only after God tells you this is the direction, you give it 100%. But until then, you have to learn to trust God. And if God is not moving in your time frame, that doesn't mean you need to do more. That means you're either not ready or the person that you're meant to be with is not ready. God doesn't need your help. When you stop going out to put yourself in situations where you could you know, meet the ideal person. And if God is telling you to do that, by all means do it. But make sure it's not because of your unbelief that God needs your help. God is able to bring a person in your life where you are today. You either believe it or you don't believe it. Like an old uh, seminary professor asked his graduated pastor who had been very successful and when he saw his professor sitting in front of him the guy got a little nervous he preached his sermon and at the end they met together he said it was nice to see you professor how do you think I did and what brings you here and that he said I wanted to come and see not how you preached and not how many people was in your church I wanted to see how big your God was. He wanted to see how much he trusted him. Yeah, he learned all the right things and this and that, but he wanted to see how he applied it. He wanted to see his life. So, same quotation fits here for us. How big is our God? Do you really trust him to bring you that person? Or do you feel that you need to jump through hoops to meet that person? The next thing is something I'm struggling with, which is a business and a direction for, for the rest of my life and my family, my family. I either trust God or I don't. I believe that he has a line already created for us that is the best for us. I have options. I could do things to get out of that line. But I need to be wise enough to wait, strong enough to wait, and see what God is going to show. And this is the most difficult part of being a Christian, waiting on God. Waiting on God is one of the most difficult things we get to do as believers. Do I want my will? Do I want God's will? Abraham waited 25 years. You guys know what happened when he decided to orchestrate his own circumstances. We are still dealing with it today, thousands of years later, in the way of terrorism. With Joshua, when God first gave them very easily Jericho, but they went ahead to attack Ai, which was nothing compared to what Joshua was, but they were defeated. Why? Because they didn't ask God. As far as they were concerned, hey, we defeated Jericho, which is like the United States, let's call it, of the time. And 
We lost a battle in Bahamas. There is no logical reason for it. They said, oh, if we could beat the United States, we could definitely beat this little village-like thing. They didn't feel the need to ask God to get his guidance, get his direction. So they failed. See, it's so tempting to rely on our own understanding. We are specifically told not to do that a lot of times. Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust the Lord. Trust God. He will guide your path straight. Our understanding is what gets us in trouble so many times. Well, if I think this is the definition of success, I need to take steps that are progressively going to lead to that. That's rationalization. And we can, God has given us minds that is able to rationalize so much. Again, I want to repeat myself. I'm not against making plans, having goals, doing your best, taking steps, being proactive. But as long as these things are done in God's direction, there is nothing wrong with that. God needs to lead us into these things. A lot of times what we do is we chart the course, we start taking steps, and we pray along the side. Major life decisions, I'm telling you again, major life decisions, whatever you're facing today, major life decisions, I believe, needs to be directed by God first, and then you do a thousand percent of your own ability, of your planning, your execution, your whatever it is, you do it, but only after God tells you. This is not to say you have to sit on your hands and do nothing. No. You do. We are called to do our best. We are supposed to be the best students, best employees, best husbands, best wives, best siblings, best brothers, best sisters, best parents. We are supposed to do our best in the direction that we are given. Let's not go ahead of God. So as to live the rest of your time in the flesh... No longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So let God decide what our direction in our life will be. Verse 3, for the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles. Having pursued the course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, Crowsing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. For the time is already past, is sufficient. It's another way of saying, how much more time do you want to waste where you were? There are believers that want to waste time in the way they were. There are believers or there are people that, that God is calling them. And they know they have to come to Christ. They know they need to surrender to God. But they say, you know, I'm too young. I don't want to be religious. I don't want to. I got to have fun. I got to do this. I'm never going to be this age again. I'm, not, I'm never going to be 20. I'm never going to be 30. I'm never going to be whatever. Time past is already sufficient. When you heard God, whether you're 12 or 20 or 30 or 40, whatever it is, it's sufficient. You wasted enough time is what God is saying. You wasted enough time following the lusts of the flesh. You wasted enough time doing the desire of the Gentiles. You know what that means in our lifetime? Doing what other people think is right. How many of you are on Facebook? Only one? Come on, you're in church now. <laughs> Good job, Pat. <laughs> so, 
So, why do I always pick on Facebook? There are other social media outlets that are equally as horrible. That's the one you regretted you gave up, that's why. What is it? I regret I gave up. Yeah, I was in it. And I said, how much more time do I want to waste here? <laughs> but being in Facebook in and of itself is not evil. But the effect it has on you is what's important. When you're there, what's happening in your mind? Is it dictating your thoughts and or your decisions and or your feelings in any way, shape or form? Is it? That's something you need to look into. Why you're there? Why are you looking at so-and-so's pictures? Oh, I, she didn't tell me she was going to go there. <laughs> oh, look, look. She's there with somebody else. <laughs> or whatever it is. What is it? Oh, I, I, I'm sure. I'm sure. There are religious posts. You know, my experience was, it was when I first heard of Facebook, this was, I don't know, many moons ago. They said, you know, you can connect with your old friends from, uh, you know, Istanbul and different parts of the world. And you catch up with them, people that you went to you know, grade school with to see what they're up to. You went to middle school with and your other friends that you had. Uh, some people went to different countries, some people, you want to see if, what's happening in that life. The first couple of months, it's nice. You catch up. I mean, you're not going to really talk to all these people every day, right? So, as you share from your life, I went here, I went there, I think this, I went, I said, okay, maybe we could share verses. It was good, I started sharing verses, and people liked it, <laughs> you know? They like it, like it, like it. But it doesn't make a difference in any way, shape, or form. It does not communicate anything other than, other than they have a sentimental descent to what you're posting, posting there. It just makes them feel good for the second, but it doesn't really change anything in a very relevant way. Then I noticed that I was spending a lot of time on it. One day, by God's grace, I said, what am I doing here? looking at what other people said, where they went, and this, this. no, this has got to stop. And do you notice that you can never get out of it 100%? <laughs> they, they, they put the temptation right there in the form of a bait where all you have to do is enter your password again. <laughs> and then everything comes bam, back. <laughs> so those years never happen. You can never delete your account. Everything that's posted is there forever. It just comes back alive. It's just a tempting situation, right? So what's the point of all this? It creates an environment where you start living for other people's opinion of you. What's worse, their supposed lives, which is being displayed on that world, gives you your standards now. Oh, if such and such went there, such and such went there, they liked it, so I should go there too. And that's something very minimal. But these standards are being built in your mind that you take as normal. So you start living for what other people think is normal, what's expected. So you start giving, you start losing ground. Once you start living for the expectation of the Gentiles, of the world, as believers, don't be afraid to be different. Don't be afraid to take a stand. Don't be afraid to speak the truth in love. For the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, 
they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation and they malign you. Those of you that have been born again by God's grace, your life has changed in some ways. And I can guarantee you almost every believer here after a while started losing friends. If you didn't lose friends after you became a believer, that might be a little dangerous situation. That means you didn't really change in, in any realistic way. But that's something for you to discern and take to the Lord about. But you will lose friends because what brought you together was the common things that you shared. That's what friendship is, right? But since you no longer have those commonalities with them, they're not going to want to be with you. Since you don't want to do all these things and they're not attractive to you, or if they are, you're choosing not to do them because God wants you not to do them, or do things that God wants you to do, which they don't want to do, they're not going to want to be with you anymore. That's normal. And you have a choice. Are you going to do what they expect you to do? Or are you going to do what God wants? That's what he means when he says, Live the rest of your time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time that's past is already sufficient. Our time is up, but I want to leave you with this thought, which I've been um, finding myself asking a lot to myself and others. Who is running your life? I asked this last night too. Who is running your life? Is it God's will or is it me? My understanding, my decision, my definition of success, my expectations, what I think is best. Is it you or is it God? And I'm telling you, every single one of us, believers, I'm talking about, in some areas of our lives are not fully surrendered to the will of God. So those are the areas where God wants us to work. So ask yourself this. Am I living for the will of God or am I living life according to my own understanding? I want to close with that question again. Who are you living for. As I wait for Jen, as we read, uh, sing this last song, hopefully into next week, you would ponder this question. Who is running my life? Who's the boss of my life? Who makes the decisions in my life? Who decides what's important in my life? Is it you or is it God?